Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Is that okay, Victor? Great. Hi. Welcome. Good timing. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for coming on this very, very hot evening to the Bronx Museum of the Arts and for spending your Friday evening with us. I think it's going to be fascinating. Um, I'm Lauren Click. I'm Director of Community and Public Programs here at the Bronx Museum, and thrilled to welcome you. Um, a couple of little bits of housekeeping. We are open, the galleries are open until 8 o'clock, um, and if you haven't seen the exhibition, it is well worth a visit. We um, are doing social media every day, all the time, so please hashtag Bronx Museum, post your photos. This is public, this is public, so please, we want you to get out there and start talking about everything we're doing here at the Bronx Museum. For later in the evening, when we're asking questions and we're asking for all of you to stand up and speak, please use this microphone over here just because we're recording. Victor's recording. Hi, V. <laughs> and so we're able to get your, your voice on the sound. We want to be sure that we can hear everything that you say and record everything that you tell us. And finally, without further ado, I'll introduce our deputy director, Jose Ortiz. Thank you, Lauren. Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches. Welcome and bienvenidos to the Bronx Museum of the Arts. My name is Jose Ortiz. I'm the deputy director of the museum. Uh, we're really delighted that you've been able to join us tonight to have a discussion about our future renovation of our um, South Wing atrium project with our architect, Monica Ponce de Leon. Um, this is the fifth meeting that we've had to um, ask our community for input on the design and to give us information on how the museum is, uh, will be used by them. Um, with us tonight, we have our fantastic museum team and our executive director, Holly Block. Wave. We also join tonight by several trustees from our board of directors. Uh, Joe Mizzy, our current chair. Let's just wave. You can wave. Uh, Linda Bloomberg is here. Alessandro Di Giusto. <laughs> Joyce Hoagie. Somewhere there. Yes. And Tim Rollins. Wait here. We're also joined tonight by many members of our community advisory council, which is uh, local residents that support us in events and recommendations in our program. So thank you for our coming this evening. I wanted to um, also point out that projects of this magnitude are not possible without the support of many, many people. And this is a long list, but it's important that we do thank everyone. Um, starting with our mayor, Bill de Blasio, council speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, the Bronx Borough President, Ruben Diaz Jr., New York City Council Majority Le Leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, council members, Vanessa Gibson, Annabelle Palma, and the Bronx Delegation of the City Council, and the New York State Assemblywoman, Latoya Joyner. Their generous support has helped us to continue with this project and really help us to increase our programs to Bronxites and to New Yorkers at large as well. We also want to thank our partners, the New York City Department of Design and Construction and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, Monica Ponce de Leon is the principal of MPDL Studio, a female-owned architectural firm that brings together a diverse team of professionals with several years of experience in the architectural field. Monica is the Dean of the School of Architecture at Princeton University and served this year as the co-curator of the exhibition at the United States Pavilion for the 15th International Biennale of Architecture in Venice. That's one long um, title. So from the beginning, we were really impressed with Monica and her process to really engage and have a lot of listening sessions, um, which is part of her process, so before she puts pen to paper, she wants to hear from people and learn about how people use our space. So 
Um, I'm delighted to welcome Mana, Monica, and I turn this over to you. And again, we have the microphones here, so when you're speaking, please come up to those microphones. Thank you. Good evening, buenas noches. I am really delighted to be here tonight. Um, we have not been working on the project at all. What we have been doing is gathering information. Um, so if you are expecting tonight drawings and a design unveiling, tonight is not the night. Uh, I'm really here to listen to you and to learn from you. But before we started, before we start the conversation, I wanted to give you a little bit of background as to what the project is. As you can see from the name of the project, the project is actually very limited. Where we have been commissioned to work on the South Wing Atrium Reconstruction. Our client is not only the Bronx Museum of the Arts, but we've actually been commissioned by the New York Department of Design and Construction which works with the Department of Cultural Affairs. So you can see that it's actually a public project with a public structure that supports it. And then you'll see underneath the name of my firm, we are in charge of architecture and historic preservation, but we also have a whole family of experts and consultants that are helping us with things like mechanical systems, structural systems, civil engineering, lighting, etc. So the project really entails the renovation and changes to the existing atrium. And we're hoping that we can stretch our budget to also tackle other issues in the building. And we have to develop those priorities during this phase. And we're hoping that you will help us develop those priorities during this phase. So for example, the internal circulation of the building and the image of the building as a whole. Right now we have the south wing and the north wing are very disjointed. The character of one and the character of the other are not necessarily speaking or keeping good company. So I don't know, I, yeah, you cannot see this. You cannot see the um, project schedule. But I wanted to highlight that construction is, suppo is uh, scheduled to begin in, um, and I'm not wearing my glasses, so I'm going to tell you the wrong thing, which will be hor horrible. Um, construction is actually expected to start in mid-2021. So it's quite a number of years from now. There is planning process that we are engaging in right now. Then there will be design iterations during the schematic design, and then we'll go into design development, construction documents, and then the actual construction. So, um, so it's a, it's a well-timed, well-paced, thoughtful project, and it's one where you're going to have several opportunities to have input into the process. We have already started this process of seeking input from the community, and this is one of what we hope will be many meetings. And this is the meetings that have already taken place or will be taking place in the next few weeks to have input on the programming of the project, the kinds of functions that we will see in the new uh, project. And as you can see, we, um, I have held a series of workshops with parents and children, but also with teenagers. We've also met with what we consider community anchors, other institutions in the Bronx that work in partnership with the museum. Um, and also we have met with the Community Advisory Council, which has been instrumental in allowing us to understand the museum in context. We also participated on Boogie and the Boulevard. And if you look in the back table, um, one of the things that we have been doing that we hope all of you do tonight is that we have been collecting the aspirations of members of the museum, everyone that comes through the museum's doors, um, in a little card. And this is something that I like to do because it really makes you think very carefully. We have asked everybody, what do you want your Bronx Museum to be in the future? 
in just five words. Some people write more than five words, that's okay. Um, but most people actually try to distill it to five words. So before you leave tonight, I'm gonna ask you to please fill a card for us. And if you think of something else in the future, you can fill as many cards as you think appropriate. Um, so the next meeting that we're gonna have in this phase, and actually the final meeting, is with the uh, Board of Trustees. So we actually have not met with the Board of Trustees yet. So I hope that you guys will speak up and participate in a conversation. I'm sorry that our microphone is fixed, but it's the best we could do. And the question I like to ask always at the beginning is, what role does the Bronx Museum play in the life of the Bronx today? It brings culture to the folks, to the community. It makes people aware of art. There's a lot of people, young as well as seniors, who are not familiar with art, whether it's from the old days, the current days. And it should be where we have a piece of art from each century so that this way people can familiarize themselves as well as like the itinerary of all the things that brings these arts to us because you know like art from Egypt, Africa, different countries, different states have different parts of mm -hmm. things that people are not familiar with, young children, older folks. You know, so the museum is a very important part of education because we're not too old to learn, uh -huh. never. So I appreciate the museum in that aspect. And I also feel that a museum should provide like a little class or a workshop for people who want to come in and experiment their art techniques. Uh -huh. Could everybody hear that? should be a, a, a center where, and it is now, but it, it, it can grow. And just in terms of architecture, which I'm into, yeah, it's gotta have a little bling. <laughs> You're in competition with, yeah, just a little like, oh, I wanna be in that place. Yeah. Visually, am I right? Spiritually, I wanna be in that place because something's going on and I can tell just by looking on the outside. Yeah. That's it. Well, originally I'm from Harlem, but now I live in the Boogie Down Bronx. And I got very familiar with the Bronx when I was invited to a tea here because I really didn't know what to expect. And when we arrived here, there was different variety of teas and we had to sample the tea. Then the lady who was facilitating this event said she wanted us to write about the tea. And since I'm a writer and a poet, I felt very excited. So I wrote about the tea, I spoke you know, to the people about my feelings about the event. And then all of a sudden, they had the tea bags on the table. They had them all around the museum and we were looking at them. Very unusual tea bags. They were dry tea bags. So we wrote on the tea bags. 
Next thing I know, my tea bag that I wrote on was sent to Arizona. I said, oh, this is wonderful. But then there are other things, like yesterday, for an example. I was just here yesterday, because I was at the event called Grandparents Around the World. And they have an event here every second Thursday, very cultural. And then um, I met a couple of politicians here. They had, you know, different things. They had um, community meetings, or they had a, a meeting about the um, prospect of buildings that's being built in this area, and there was a lot of concern about that, okay? And then I explored, the, oh, I, b I belong to a senior center, so I invite my seniors here also, but then I explored the museum. I have been here so much that the guards know me just by knowing me, you know? And this place is just has so much ambiance, and I feel like I'm in lower Manhattan, like in Soho. Okay, this place is very cultural. I even went upstairs one time to a workshop and the kids were drawing. And I said, oh, can I draw? Can I have fun with them? And they allowed me to draw. It was wonderful. I have been to the Boogie on the Boulevard. I wrote a poem about this museum. I didn't give it to them yet because it has to be copywritten. And I haven't copywritten it yet. And I went to a workshop. I forgot the man's name, but it was called Open Mic because I am a poet. Okay, and I learned a lot from that exercise class. This is my ho other home away from home, my rain center, my senior center, my home away from home. This is my culture home. I come here to let loose. Thank you. Hello everyone, for those that don't know me, my name is Sincero, I'm a contemporary artist uh, and I'm um, an abstract painter. I'm currently exhibiting in uh, Tribeca and just finished exhibiting in Chelsea. Um, I'm not speaking for myself here today, but I want to speak for a multitude of artists that are in our very own backyard here in the Bronx. A lot of artists with talent, whether they're sculpturists, painters, um, artisans, and whatever right that they produce their art. Um, I had to venture outside of the Bronx because in seeking for opportunities in the Bronx, I couldn't find any. And in applying for grants within Bronx organizations, it's the only way I was able to reach this museum and be considered for a one-day pop-up for a quarter of over $3,800 just to get a day in one of the rooms here, and I had to use their technician services and also um, a couple other requirements that were you know, listed in the quote. But when you email them, and I'm only speaking for myself, I don't want to say generally, and you send your press kit or your catalog, you're being told that unsolicited submissions are not being accepted and it's kind of like put on the back burner if there is a back burner. Um, I think that what the museum can actually do is play a bigger role in creating opportunities for artists that are from the Bronx. And I am not saying to exclude anyone else from outside the Bronx, but I'm saying create opportunities for artists that are in the Bronx that could be tomorrow's, you know, Matisse's, Picasso's, you know, De Kooning's, Clifford Stills. I'm, I'm talking about like, you know, it, it, it's, it's fine and dandy when I see stuff like, you know, opportunities for kids and their families and stuff like that. I have a 13-year-old, 14-year-old daughter that just got accepted into Gramercy Arts High School, so I can see the need for programs for kids and their families. I'm not saying get rid of that program. But at the same token, you have other foundations in the Bronx like Casita Maria that will cater to those younger generations. But what's gonna happen to the emerging, the mid-career, artists that are looking for opportunities and can't find it within their own borough. Sometimes, you know, it stings a little bit when you're discarded kind of like to the side of the road by your own community. So I think that needs to change and I think it needs to start with, you know, the Bronx Museum because, you know, this is like a key point in the Bronx that should be respected and I think is respected by a majority of people both in and outside the Bronx and 
it shouldn't be up me up here speaking up for the voiceless, but it should be the museum speaking up for the artists from the Bronx to create opportunities for them and show the art of boroughs that we have our very own creative talent here. Create our own supply and demand in the Bronx. Make people from outside the Bronx want to come into the Bronx to see what we've discovered in the Bronx. Not have other people from outside the borough come to the Bronx and say, we've discovered something that's always existed here and they're not even from here. So that's it. My name is Sincero. And um, I also have a not-for-profit 501c3 uh, uh, public arts organization in the Bronx. It's called Tag Public Arts Project. And we always have open calls. I create opportunities for artists from outside the Bronx, national, internationally, and from the Bronx. And I have lists to prove and to show for it. And I think other organizations that are way bigger than I am, with less money than I, with, that I have, I raised my own money. I created my own artist stipend, you, uh, you know, last week because I, I mean, not last week, a couple of months ago because I couldn't get grants, you know. So I created my first artist stipend for an artist in the Bronx for $7,200, but it was almost $12,000 that I raised on my own because no one would give me an opportunity, so I created my own opportunity. But there's other artists out here that don't have the, the ability or the business savvy to go about that. And we need institutions like this to be the guiding hand for those artists that don't have those resources readily available to them so they could flourish and grow and say that they're part to be, proud to be part of the Bronx. And that's it. Thank you. This is actually, oh. Maybe I should stay on this question. I was going to say this, is a good, this was a good segue for the next question, but if you want to answer this one, or do you want me to go to the next one? I think it's a complicated mix of curatorial and architectural stuff that we're talking about here. This is both. And right now, I think our outreach to the community is fabulous. I'm just dazzled by it every time I meet it. There's so many thousands of kids who come through here every year, and they learn so much, and, and they go out into the world more rounded and more aware of their own possibilities. It thrills me that that happens. But curatorially, I don't see that we're doing anything with local Bronx artists. And I wonder if that's partly because we don't have a dedicated space. If we had a place for local artists, a place where we could talk to the many communities that exist here, the pure Bronx, the Dominican, the Puerto Rican, the West African, there's so many cultures here, we're so rich. And if you're not an established artist, we don't have a place for you. We, we do, in fact, have a lobby you know, we have a coffee shop where people come. We, if we had a, a kind of welcoming space, it would be awfully nice to have some piece of it be open, not just to the public to come and be, but to see and to represent local people. I, you know, my, you know <laughs> my thing is, I want this place to feel warm and welcoming. And I think it's Harry Stack Sullivan textbook stuff. We invent ourselves, we see ourselves in the mirror of other people. I would like everybody who comes in the door, at some moment, not every day of every year, but at some moment to know that they, they can see themselves here. And that's, I believe, as architectural as it is So I, I think this last couple of comments are a really good transition to what are the sort of challenges that the museum building currently has and that the museum building currently proposes. And I will be really uh, curious to hear your point of view. As an architect, I have big opinions. Um, but from the point of view of those who use the building frequently, I'm always surprised by the things that I discover. Does anyone want to go first? Oh. 
Wait, what am I going to say? Um, my name is William Kasari. I'm on the CAC, Community Advisory Council, here at the museum. Um, by museum building, do you mean the whole, you mean both buildings? Yeah, the whole hall. Right. I would say the communication between the old, the south wing building and this building is not great. Um, I guess that's being kind, but for instance, <laughs> for instance, the other night there was an event um, downstairs, the Willy Ninja event, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll pop up and see the exhibit, but it's kind of hard once you're downstairs to get to the exhibits up here, which were um, closing. Um, so that, that's one thing, the, the kind of articulation between the two spaces, that was probably my biggest um, thing I noticed when I first came here, but I like both spaces. And I like the wood floors, and I like the feeling in the old building, and I like this space. It's just kind of, you really do feel the disconnect between the two. Um, that's probably my biggest challenge, other than the sound in this room, which I've been, <laughs> which everyone has pointed out. But um, that's my biggest thing. So I was wondering how, how the atrium or the new cube you're designing might communicate or harmonize those two spaces. Sure. Anybody else? Hi, I'm John Kruskevich. I live across the street in Executive Towers, and I look at this building every day, and I walk past it twice a day on my way to the subway. And I think uh, I love the museum. I love what it does. I love the programming. Uh, I think it's terrific. I came here well before I lived here. But it, you have to know that it's such a gem if you're just walking by it. Uh, you can't see inside. Uh, it's, even if you look through the glass, it's so bright outside during the day, and it's so dark in here. So it lacks transparency. And it's also a great opportunity because it's on the concourse. It's on one of the highest points in the Bronx. It could be this amazing beacon day and night. One evening, I looked out my uh, kitchen window, and the museum was projecting images inside the gallery. You're shaking your head, I see. Uh, it was very much appreciated because people on the concourse could see it, pedestrians, people driving could see it for that moment while they were stopped at the light at 165th Street. So uh, there's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because you, you are at such a prominent location, both pedestrians and, uh, and uh, uh, vehicular traffic. And I'd like to see something done to make people more aware of how wonderful the museum is inside, make it more welcoming uh, to people, architecturally. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Tanya. Um, I've been coming to this museum ever since I was about 10 years old. <laughs> I'm not going to say how old I am now. <laughs> but um, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question, but it, it's, pi it's piggybacking off what he said about not being able to see inside. You guys at one point used to have a count of events in the window, and you don't do that anymore. You know? And I, and I used to look, through, look at it and stuff. You know? So I don't know if you want to maybe bring, back that, bring that back in some way. just flashed through my head a second ago. Because I do go to a lot of events here sometimes late at night, and when I come outside, I turn around and I look at the building. And then I thought, what if they had some of these track lights outside, colorful ones, and for maybe 20 minute intervals, let the light shine on the building so people that are passing by, or even the tour buses that are passing by, or the Grand Concourse bus that's passing by, so they can see the architect 
because the architect of this building is phenomenal. And if they saw the, I would call it the ge geometry aspect of how this building was designed, they might want to stop by the next time and come inside. Um, I've been living in the Bronx for like th all my life, and this was actually my first time coming in here. So I'm glad that I took the time out to come and, um, and, and join all of y'all and appreciate the culture of this. And I always pass it all the time, but I just never took time out to actually come in here. And I'm glad I did that. So I just wanted to say that. So we should ask you, how come you didn't come in before? <laughs> Other challenges? I, I, I'm sorry, my name's Killian Jordan and I'm also on the CAC and I spoke before more about the inside than the outside, but I live on the next corner, so I pass the building all the time. I perform an important public service because at least twice a week, when I pass by, there is somebody standing in front of the museum looking at it and saying to their companion, oh, it's not open. <laughs> Even when it is. Does anybody want to add to that? The doors, are, is the entry clear? Can we do a better job? No. Can we do a better job with the entrance? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> When people pass by and they see that it looks so dark, it's not inviting enough. We need to make it so that when we pass by and the people say, is it closed or is it open? They can see their people walking around and enjoying the art. And maybe have it open one night a week where it's late. Cause like if you come home from work and you want to go somewhere and just sit down for a little while and relax, this would be a very nice place to come and do that, you know. So I don't live on this side of the Bronx. I live way on the other side, but I do come over here a lot because it's the most peaceful part of the Bronx for me, you know. So by coming here, that's my peace, and I need to be able to see some things and enjoy what I see when I come, you know, I'm getting old. <laughs> and then the final question, and again, I'm hoping that you will all answer this question and put it in, the, in our little mailbox, is what are your aspirations for the museum's future? If you had a magic wand, what would you like to see the museum be in the future? Who wants to go first? So I've lived in the Bronx all of my life. And I left and I came back. I'm 39 years old. I've taken my kids to a dozen museums. And I've never known about this museum until recently that a friend pointed it out to me. And this, this is amazing. You know, I'm from the South Bronx, born and raised. And like this gentleman said here, I grew up around so many amazing artists who have taken a, uh, another path because they never had the opportunity to express themselves or show their art. And it's and it's heartbreaking because they deserve that chance. You know, I'm sure that if I've lived here all my life and didn't know about this place, there's kids in my neighborhood and neighborhoods surrounding that place that have never even heard of this. So yeah, my aspirations is let's venture out further into the Bronx, into the South Bronx, where there's kids who have the talent and don't, don't have an outlet or means to express themselves. Because I think that's very important because it's when you don't have an outlet 
and when you don't have anyone pushing you in the right direction, that you go in the wrong direction. And, and then it, it goes downhill from there. And I don't think that's fair. So to them, they deserve it. I, I just want to touch base again on the resources that are available in the Bronx that are not directly related to the Bronx Museum, but can be. And maybe that's something that you can, the museum can work uh, towards building uh, a bridge with to build a better future for the museum. Okay, so like for example, when we're painting murals in the Bronx, right, we just did one on Zariga and Westchester Avenue, uh, couple of weeks back for a block party. Okay, the, the 45th precinct closed off the streets, we had permits, the whole nine yards. We had artists, muralists, painting live. At one point, one of the artists that we had was an emerging artist, uh, her name was uh, uh, Danielle De Jesus, and she was doing a mural that had female role models in her mural. After a while, there was like, a circle of little kids completely, completely sitting around her. And at one point, and what we try to do is we try to encourage artists to besides painting with an aerosol can, you know, I want to take it back to the Great Depression days of like the WPA program and when murals were being made by people like Vega and, and stuff like that where a three or four or five year old can walk down the street and instead of seeing someone painting with aerosol all the time, they could see someone painting with acrylic paint and with brushes, and now that subconsciously becomes the norm. And then, you, then from that point, you're, you're actually elevating the art form to another level, okay? And for example, once again, I mentioned my daughter's school, Gramercy Art School. They have a direct relationship with a law firm in the community, with NYU, with Pace University, and they give them tutoring afterwards, and the law firm actually creates opportunities for the artists from the school to exhibit some of their best works in the lobbies of their law firm. So if you have people, I mean, I know you have the Bronx Council of the Arts and they have the way once you win, you know, and Brio and all that stuff, and when you win the awards, you have those opportunities. I'm saying tap into other organizations that don't have those opportunities to give their members uh, exposure or pick kids from, let's say, Casita Maria that are more mature, let's say, in their, their art. And do you know what it would do to a 12 or 13-year-old kid to be in a group show at the Bronx Museum? That in itself would be life-changing. There's a lot of people, when I was growing up, you know, they, they actually, I, I had an artist from France that, that painted for me. She's, from, she's French from London. And she was telling me how where, where they live from young, they're, they're, they're taught certain types of curriculums and then that's what they want you to venture off to grow up to be when you become an adult, you know? And one of the strongest things that she said she was attracted to was art. But that was one of the things that they were not really encouraged to do because they were saying, well, right after college, there's not gonna be a big career waiting for you. Well, maybe that can change if institutions like this start encouraging kids at a younger age and then pairing them off with, with uh, teaching artists and mentors. And it could start right here. So that's something to so hope that's something that exists in the community. Thank you. I guess we did figure it out. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been really great to hear some of the opinions of people that have spoken before me. I have two very quick things to say. The first is an aspiration would be to see a surge of really great young professional energy in this space and take advantage of some of the young energy that is in the borough that doesn't come to the museum as often. And then the second thing is, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to walk around the neighborhood, but there's some really great parks, Joyce Kilmer, Malali, uh, Cretona, not too far. So I'd love to see some public art or like uh, Bronx Museum satellite s things set up in the park. Maybe some sculptures in those parks. 
on the Grand Concourse. They did Boogie on the Boulevard, which was really great. So using a lot more of the outdoor spaces and the parks in the area would be a really, really great way to bring in the pedestrians that already walk on the Grand Concourse. So those are two things. I just, I'm, I'm an architect, so I have, uh, there's a lot of stakeholders on, and what the, th there's a lot of stakeholders on what the museum can be, but I'll speak to you as an architect. Okay. Um, and uh, after seeing today's proposal the, for the Perelman uh, project down at Grand Zero, the theater, which is a cube and a stair on a very public space, different scales, different contexts, I'll say one word, accessibility. So a lot of the issues of uh, the stakeholders have talked about is accessibility, but I'm talking to you now in the physical reality of that, and I know this building in particular is so challenged by that. So I would just highlight that, highlight that as something, as an aspiration if to get that. Um, about 25 years ago, uh, I was with this organization called Learning Leavers with the public school. And at that time, they were looking for volunteers to learn this project called Artworks. So at that time, I was in Co-op City area, and I said, oh, Artworks, I think I'm going to like this. So they taught us at the museum um, at 84th Street. You know, the big museum, I can't think of the name. You know, I'm short term, I'm, I'm a senior. So then, as we learned everything about the collages, Van Gogh, Monet, okay, all that stuff, we had to go back to the schools, to third graders and the teachers and teach them. So I said, oh, I'm excited. I thought I was going to do this in Co-op City. They sent me right over here on the Grand Concourse. I think the street was 183rd Street. I think it was PS9. I had to teach that particular art to the students and the teachers. Then we had to give them a trip to the museum and we were sectioned off and we had to give them a, uh, a tour. So I gave them a tour about the Coliseums, the different art, the watercolors and all this stuff. Then after the end of the, um, that particular event, the museum gave us passes for the students and for their family. Now it would be nice if they had something like that here to teach the students here all of the different type of art that's here. Because this museum just doesn't have paintings. They have like, you can have a tire, or you can have um, bottle caps and make an image, and it's art, okay? Th they have to be exposed to this, and maybe we could teach them everything that the museum is offering or what the museum has, and then take it to the schools and then bring them here, okay? Another thing I want to mention that I am a senior, I'm a great grandparent, and I do belong to a main center, quite a few of them. And as I speak to the, um, the seniors about the trip like grandparents around the world, and I ask them, would you like to go? I don't know what's going on, but a lot of people don't know about this place. And I ask them, well, where did you live all your life? Or well, I just came here maybe 10 years ago. Well. There's not this, like this, it's a non-cultural part of the Bronx that doesn't know anything about art. So maybe some of your people from the board of directors or your trustees or your benefactors can put some kind of publication, okay, or start something like Night of the Museum. That was a wonderful movie I saw, and let the museum come alive at night. So some people have to work all day, the kids are in school, and maybe on the weekend they need Friday night at the museum and let them see the art. This is for it. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak? I have a you were talking about the old building and the new building. I don't think that is. I was thinking that to make the old building like the old Bronx, and have a passageway coming into the new building and make it the new Bronx. So you know, like going from the past into the future, but have paintings and things that would relate to olden days of the Bronx, you know, like a historical type 
venture coming into the new building. You understand what I'm saying? And that would make it more of an interest because you're dealing with something that's history as well as the present. And a lot of children, they don't know what the history is of the Bronx. I try to tell my grandson the Bronx had farmlands on Pelham Parkway and Indians lived up here. And that the Seven Lakes was Indians and they, he was like, Nana, what are you talking about? <laughs> so this is what they need to know. Wow. They need to know what their history is with their eyes other than in a book because they relate better like that. And this way they learn so when they get older, they will know I came from some place that was historical and important. You're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what the museum should be about. The past into the future. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. One of the first things we talked about in the CAC meetings several years ago was a way to animate the sidewalk and to the woman's comment in the back and someone else's comment about the closed doors, it, we still haven't really succeeded in, when there's a museum in the event, there's hundreds of people getting off buses right outside. They just walk by. They're like, you wouldn't even have to spend any money to somehow make the sidewalk or maybe with the cube you're designing. I just watch the people come off the bus and they walk right past the museum and we still haven't really done that. We've talked about it. Some events, we've had stuff out there, obviously Boogie on the Boulevard, but even when there's an event inside, even just letting people somehow to, to bring the sidewalk alive, at least during some events, yeah, people to, to just watch anytime, get off the bus, and they're right there. So just somehow, maybe with the cube, and then maybe that can be an event space for um, some of the things people are talking about. Um, one thing that I've seen was um, I went to uh, the Jacob Javits uh, not so long ago, and when you're walking on the street, um, you see how the bus stop stands are situated. They've actually taken some of the street areas and they've turned them into digital displays that are currently like rotating digitally what's going to be uh, coming in the near future at the center. So that helps generate you know, the, an increase in their client retention because now people are knowledgeable of what's happening indoors, especially if they can see indoors, and that'll help better the museum and also their relationship with the community. So instead of spending all this money on a statue, you can actually put digital displays out front and it'll work better to service the museum and the community as opposed to otherwise. Thank you. We're running out of time. I'm wondering if there is final comments. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm always bringing my kids. Well, right now it's just one, but I have a daughter and another son. And sometimes when I say, oh, there's a workshop in the museum, let's go, they always say, oh, again, mom? But they ended up having fun and my oldest, she is um, applying for the teen council, and she she was in last year, and I'm just curious, and I ask her, what do you wanna do in the future? And she say, I wanna work in the museum, so that's my aspiration. One more? Yeah. I'm about to trip on the cable, which would not be fun. <laughs> Thanks. I just want to thank the museum and thank you for uh, allowing us to share in the process. And I think this process is really important. I love this particular form, but I think it was thought of as a form and then the uses shoved into the form. And I have my aspiration is that whatever happens on the corner 
will be from the inside out. And I have the feeling, I think we all share that, that that will happen. So I want to thank everybody. Hi, I just wanted to, um, okay. I just want to make a comment about the bus nuts, um, people just getting off the bus. Maybe like the bus shelter could be like a super bionic art <laughs> display or something, you know? So it's right there and you can see it like Arrow or something like a museum, like, you know, just come on in. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to say that I live right next door to the museum. I've been there 50 years, and uh, this place is everything to me. So it has my support in everything that it does, but I also just want to say that I appreciate the fact that within the last 10 years, uh, I've seen it reflect the community. I've seen it reflect the Africans, the Mexicans, the Bangladesh community. I've seen it do that. Uh, and I know it's going to get bigger, it's going to get better, and from Riverdale to City Island, from Fordham Road to 138th Street, we're all going to crowd it. People know about it, people are coming, and I see it and I love it, I look forward to the new building. Um, I'm just hoping to have a wing named after me, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I just appreciate the museum, I appreciate it with the art, I mean, to be honest, I've never heard of Elizabeth Catlett until I came here, and that's sad to say. So I get introduced to art. I, I love art more. I become more culturally involved with my community, and it's because of this. I come here, I meditate, I sneak and eat the food when they put it out, and I just want to say thank you to the museum staff, and I look forward to the new building. She has something, she has a question, and I think it's important that she wanted to ask. I'm very shy if you don't know me. Um, but I did want to ask, uh, in the older building, there is a scripture verse um, piggybacking on, uh, on her remarks. So just making sure that that scripture verse stays there. Good evening, everybody. How you doing? My name is Kev Lawrence. I'm sorry I'm a little late. As you can see, I'm still sweating. My shirt is off of there. I was running here, really. Uh, I wanted to talk about the architecture. Remember we had a meeting before, and I was wondering, since we're the Bronx Museum, I was wondering if possible, either during the renovation or even afterwards, if we could possibly have a, almost like a small jumbotron, like how BAM has it in Brooklyn. In downtown Brooklyn, they have their Brooklyn Arts, mu Arts and Museum, or Musical, excuse me. But they have that there so the people can know what's going to be coming up for the following month, months, and stuff like that. So at least people walking by, they can catch their eye when they see that and say, well, you know what, something's about to happen over here. Hey, I'm Irish, and they're doing something for the people over here in Ireland, so I might want to go over here. So at least I know. And also, last thing, there is, I forgot the name of it, but we could research it. There is like an app for anybody that's walking by they could pick up you wires, the wireless Wi-Fi connection and let you know, hey, this is going on right now, this or this time or this date, if you're in like a, like a five mile radius or a block radius. So that's what I wanted to say, and I want to say thank you to everybody here, bring this here, because as a collective, we can make things happen. Thank you to the wonderful staff here. Of course, Ms. Holly Block and everybody else. Thank you. I'm going to go and cool off a little bit, all right? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is extremely helpful to the process, and it's very much for me a way to kickstart the process. I'm going to invite everybody to please fill the little cards and put them in the mailbox because it becomes a record of what is important. We talked about a lot of issues, so if you could pick the one that is the most important to you, and again, you can fill more than one card. Um, and put it in the box. I would really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, all, all of you, for coming. Thank you.